So our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Kalp. Hi. <laughs> Here you are. I don't think he needs an introduction uh, to this audience. And um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to give a long um, description of the achievements of each speaker. And But please find them in your booklets and please read them. And we're happy to have Dr. Kalp as our speaker. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by thanking Hande for putting together this uh, wonderful symposium, which uh, has really a, a life, and it's, it's really terrific to be here. So I'm going to talk about a subject that I really don't know much about, and this is the first time I've given this talk, so it may last about 14 seconds, and then the whole thing's over. So, um, so membrane traffic defects are very common in neurodegenerative diseases. And let me just begin by the most simple understanding of what membrane trafficking is about. It's a way of moving things out of the cell or moving things into cells. Let's see if I could, yeah. So the so-called secretory pathway begins with uh, endoplasmic reticulum, where the proteins are generated that are going to be, let's say, secreted. Sometimes they travel through the Golgi apparatus to internal sites. There are proteins that need to move from the ER through the Golgi to some place in the cell. Sometimes they end up on the cell surface, and sometimes they're secreted. And this is balanced by um, an in pathway, an, an, uh, an uh, endosomal pathway, which basically is a way for cells to um, intake nutrients. Uh, so it can be from the uh, endosomal pathway can take nutrients in from the space outside of cells. It can be also involved in uh, endocytosis or internalization of membrane proteins, and also other proteins that are within the cell can undergo um, incorporation into endosomes. So it's, these, these pathways are critical for um, cell biology. And we know actually a lot about the um, cell and molecular biology of the, these two pathways, the secretory pathway and the, the endocytic pathway. Again, um, we know many of the molecules that are involved in uh, sequestering molecules that, that will end up into these little vesicles. They go from the ER to this intermediate compartment. They get uh, processed in the Golgi apparatus and then they can uh, egress, leave the cell. And, it's, and as I said, it's balanced by this uh, internalization pathway. So a little straightforward um, textbook type of cell biology. The uh, creation of vesicles in the endoplasmic reticulum involves uh, several different uh, proteins. The, the key ones I want to point out are the coat proteins and also these small GTPases. The uh, coat proteins with the GTPases leads to um, membrane curvature and then um, scission from the, from the uh, ER membrane. And in doing so, it also concentrates uh, membrane cargo as well as uh, soluble cargo. Once this baby buds off, the coat proteins uh, get liberated. And when the vesicle finds its appropriate target, a fusion event occurs when the V snare proteins and the T snare proteins interact. Here's a point, trust me. So GTPases, uh, small uh, monomeric proteins that turn GTP into GDP are the critical drivers of several of these events. Just one example is that when GDP is exchanged for GTP, it embeds in the membrane that catalyzes the organization of these coat proteins. When the GTP is uh, hydrolyzed to GDP, the coat proteins leave, and that's how you get that uncoated vesicle which finds its target. And I promise that this has a point. Oh, yes. The Rab proteins are small GTPases which play a critical role in um, targeting, getting the right vesicle to the right compartment. And the point is that this is abnormalities in this system are commonly seen in neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so RAB1 is important in that anterograde trafficking. It's seen in several different models of ALS. The c 9 orf 72 protein is a guanine nucleotide exchange factor for small uh, GTPases. This is a nice review article. 
from last year. And I should also mention that this is seen in many, many other neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. It's one of the early studies from um, Aaron Gittler's lab on uh, alpha-synuclein toxicity, which is a model of, which is uh, implicated in Parkinson's disease. So not to hit you over the head with it too much, but this anterograde pathway going from the ER to the Golgi is driven by the uh, RAB GTPases, and this retrograde pathway is driven by something called the ARF GTPases. And you have to have these guys in balance because there's all sorts of proteins that are ending up in the cis Golgi and beyond. And if they weren't retrieved and brought back to the ER, they would, they, that, that deprivation would be unhealthful to cells. So it's, it's actually the balance of this forward and retrograde trafficking, which is critical for cell health. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about ARF GTPases for the rest of this talk. So again, ARF GTPases are, are inactive when they have GDP bound and active when they have GT bound, GTP bound. The GEFs or the guanine nucleotide exchange factors are the, are the drivers for activation of ARFs, and the, guanine, the GTPA is activating proteins. The GAPs are what turn it off. Notice green versus red. So the GEFs, the activators of the ARF GTPAs, has fallen into several different families, um, and a lot of the specificity of where membrane-bound vesicles end up is driven by the, um, the localization of the various ARF GEFs. So more than 10 years ago, um, I happened to be snooping through um, this journal, and Michael Familak's group in Germany uh, developed a drug which inhibited one of the ARF GEFs, one of the families of ARF GEFs, this so-called cytohesin family. And um, for reasons in retrospect which turned out to be wrong, I thought that it might be interesting to study. So we got a little bit of this compound and we tested it in our model of neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, what we found was that when you administered, I, I'm not exactly sure how this thing is pronounced, so I just call it second H3, that in our models where mutant SOD or another protein mutant P150 glute is overexpressed, it kills motor neurons and this um, compound protected. So just let me briefly tell you our, the way our model works. We grow um, rat neurons on glass cover slips with astrocytes. They're derived from embryonic spinal cord. We let them grow for two weeks. They develop lots of synapses. They're electrically active. They're mature using a variety of different ways of measuring maturity. You can identify motor neurons by an immunological, uh, immuno, immunocytochemical stain, and we can just count the number of motor neurons. So in this model, when you express um, mutant SOD, a, a gene that causes familial ALS, you get motor neuron death, this drug protects against it. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Um, in another model, this was work that was done in Justin Achita's lab. This is a C9 model system, and in this model, the um, induced pluripotent stem cells are missing one copy of the C9 gene to simulate what happens when the C9 hexanucleotide repeat expansion is, is enlarged. It suppresses the expression of the endogenous protein. And this assay is to just monitor the survival of Justin's team, monitors the survival of motor neurons over time. And the green are the controls. So this is over time, you get a sort of a slow decrement in the number of motor neurons. If you're from the C9 model, there's an accelerated death of motor neurons over time. One of the drugs he discovered in his uh, screen was this compound in red. And it turns out that second H3 in this model was um, equally protective. So that's kind of an interesting thing too. That's a frog. So it's nice to work with drugs, but genetic tools are probably better. So it turns out that the cytohesins are um, very conserved at the amino acid as well as nucleotide sequence, but we were able to find a consensus sequence that we could target with um, a microRNA. And it turns out that when we generated this microRNA, it indeed knocks down all three cytohesins. And when we um, express that cytohesin knockdown in a 
microRNA in a virus, it protects against mutant sod toxicity. So this is just a higher dose. So now, by, by a drug, by genetic knockdown, we can reduce the toxicity of mutant SOD. And in a different model system uh, that appears to be important for C9 disease, it also appears to be protective. OK. What is that associated with? Well, it's associated with a reduction in the abundance of both misfolded SOD as well as aggregated SOD. So there's an, an antibody that recognizes misfolded SOD. And the abundance of that species is reduced in the presence of the drug, also by the knockdown of the cytohesins, as well as also a reduction in the abundance of soluble and insoluble SOD. So it's protective in a couple of different models, and it's associated with a reduction in the abundance of the bad protein. Okay. So cytohesins are the GEFs. They are the things that activate the ARF GTPases. The ARF GTPases are actually a four, uh, five or six different proteins. Um, ARF2 is preserved in... Um, mammals, in, um, I'm sorry, in rodents, but humans do not have an ARF2. So if you reduce the activity of the ARFs by inhibiting the GEFs, then you should be um, altering the activity of one or more of the ARF GTPases. So our goal was to reduce the abundance of each of these individually and see what happens. Turns out there's a little bit of a problem, which is that the amino acid sequence of the ARF GTPases is, is incredibly um, similar. In fact, it's almost hard to find out where they're different, but there are a couple of places where, where they actually are different. But, but mostly at the amino acid levels, they're super conserved. Fortunately, at the nucleotide level, there's a little bit more wiggle room. And so a very talented senior scientist in my, my lab, uh, Lei Zheng, who's actually not in this country anymore, developed microRNAs that could knock down individual ARFs. And let me just point out to you that he was able to develop a, a tool that knocks down ARF1 specifically, but none of the other ARFs, also for ARF2, ARF3, ARF4, ARF5, ARF6. And then he was just showing off when he made one that could knock down all of them. So now we had a tool that we could use to manipulate the ARF expression, not the Guanine nucleotide expression, uh, not the guanine nucleotide exchange factor, and see what see what that does to toxicity. So, um, one of the things we were curious at was, does the um, abundance of any of the ARFs differ in cells that are um, wild type cells, like maybe they'd just be expressing a, a reporter protein, or maybe mutant SOD or mutant TDP43? So this was a little bit of a trick, tricky problem because there are no antibodies that can distinguish ARF1 through 6. So we worked with the proteomics core at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to tune the mass spec machine to find peptides that could distinguish them. And we couldn't exactly distinguish 1 from 3, but we could distinguish this pair from R4, R6, R2. And Although it was a lot of work, it turns out there aren't any differences when you express mutant proteins or TDP43 in the expression levels of any of the ARFs. We then looked at uh, trafficking of proteins through the ER into the Golgi. And one way that you can do that is for looking at the maturation of proteins. So when proteins are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum, they have a, um, a nine, a, 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 a sugar modification, which has nine different sugars associated with it. This then gets modified, and as um, proteins that are glycosylated migrate from the ER to the Golgi, this code of glycosylation changes, and sensitivity to it, an enzyme called endo-H, is lost. So um, this was done in collaboration with uh, Joe Mazzulli's lab. First, let me show you that when you express mutant SOD, that the uh, immature version of um, proteins such as uh, nicastrin or glucocerebrosidase is um, slowed, so proteins are not moving through the secretory pathway in a, in a normal way. If you inhibit with the drug, you actually rescue that. You, proteins are now moving through the secretory pathway um, in the, um, at a normal rate. 
And we saw this both with the drug and with knockdown of ARF2. So ARF2 is um, potentially one of the targets who has reduced activity when we inhibit the cytohesin family of GEFs. Finally, what we did is we asked about uh, neuroprotection, and when we look at knockdown of ARF1, 2, 3, 4, or 6, that ARF2 knockdown, actually an ARF3 knockdown, uh, are protective against the toxicity of mutant SOD. Turns out that a different set are protective against the toxicity of TDP43 in our primary neuron model. So just to, to sort of wrap it up, we, th we think that there are intracellular uh, trafficking defects in, in many, probably all, neurodegenerative diseases. The RABs are key players, and so are ARFs. The RABs are the ones that drive the anterograde traffic from the ER to the Golgi. The ARFs are the ones that uh, drive the retrograde traffic from the Golgi to the ER. We think that perhaps there's a balance of RAB-dependent forward and ARF-dependent retro trafficking, and that when mutant proteins lead to inhibition of forward, you want to balance it by reducing backward trafficking. And this may lead to um, uh, restoration of protein homeostasis and handling of misfolded proteins. So I want to thank uh, the people that did this work, uh, Yelena, uh, Lei, and Jin Bin. Yelena is in the back. Hi, Yelena. Um, the proteomic work was done at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, Dr. Wani and Joe's lab uh, helped did the uh, protein trafficking assays by uh, biochemical ones. Um, Justin Achita did that, did that early study using the haploinsufficient C9 cells. Um, and this is the support, and I thank you very much for your attention. So maybe we can open again for questions. Fire when ready. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I killed them. So in your opening slide, uh, you mentioned about those small GTPAs is very important for endocytosis and as well as exocytosis. And the uh, compounds that you actually used in your studies, um, how are they related? Or th are they also acting on the small GTPases? And if they are, uh, or if they are not, uh, is there a compensation mechanism that you can use? So this is, a, to me, a very complicated area. Um, the trafficking is, a very, is, is not sort of my area, but this is kind of where it has ended up. I I'm, think that it's very likely that there are compensatory changes when you remove one piece out of the system. I would imagine that, that others take, take the place. The, the defects in um, anterograde traffic appear to be a common theme. As, as I mentioned, there's actually a fairly rich literature about that. Uh, I'm not familiar with anything on the retrograde pathway. Really interesting, Bob. Um, I'm wondering about the haploid sufficiency effect on the C9 line. So that was just to uh, make sure I understand it. Was that a, the small molecule was an activator of? So, so the Justin Achita's line is haploid insufficient for C9. He did a drug screen, and he found a, you know his best good drug was what he showed. And I just sent him some of the GEF inhibitor, the second H3. It's a GEF inhibitor. Yeah, and it has the same effect. So do you know, has he, or have you guys tested it in a, um, a non haploid sufficient line? I'm um, just wondering whether how, because that would tell you how relevant this pathway is in, you know, in, their phys in cases where you have the mutation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, I, I, what phenotypes would you look for in a... Um, I think Justin has a beautiful survival assay. Just a survival just assay. That same assay, but yeah. instead of the haploid sufficient line and his C9 lines. Yeah, that's that a good idea. It could also be a, a nice way to decipher how significant haploid sufficiency is. Because it seems like your molecule, and I think it's also true for his molecule, it, it seems to be activating endosomal trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's a good point. I should, a, I, could, yeah. I should do that. Okay, thank you. This completes the first uh, science session, and I want to reiterate that based on our three speakers, 
Uh, ALS is a complex disease. And as you can imagine, there is not only one mechanism and there's really not one model system. So Dr. Uday Pandey uh, told us about the model systems that he uses. And he also tries to understand the link between TBI and ALS. And Dr. Kiskin has told us about the stem cells and the mechanisms that he's trying to reveal using uh, stem cells as a model. And again, Dr. Kalp uh, was talking about the uh, membrane and trafficking. And we think that patients have similar phenotypes maybe, but the underlying causes may be different. And that's why we try to bring all our knowledge and expertise together to find the common mechanisms as well as unique mechanisms so that we understand a better uh, treatment uh, strategy. So we would like to give a coffee break now and we will come back again and we will have three more speakers, then we will have lunch break. So please enjoy coffee and tea and I will see you in about 15 minutes. Thank you so much.